Amen. Well, we are going to begin a series on the general epistles. Uh, it, I'm going to be using book eight from my discipleship series. It's entitled The General Epistles. Um, so if you uh, look at book eight and see that title, you've got the right one. And uh, if you'd like to purchase a copy of the notes, you can. It's not necessary. Um, and uh, I often add quite a bit more to it uh, as I'm preaching, but uh, using the same notes that are in the book uh, as a starting point. So James chapter 1 is where we're going to be tonight, the book of James. And uh, the word epistle just means a letter. So when we say the general epistles, the general letters... These are the letters that were not written by the Apostle Paul. You really have two groups of epistles. You have the Pauline epistles, and then you have the general epistles. The Pauline letters or epistles were written by Paul. That's why we call them Pauline. Um, and uh, those include everything from Romans up through, I believe, Hebrews. Uh, and then James through Jude, right before Revelation, is the general epistle section of Scripture. And you have um, different writers in there. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, those writers here for a second. Uh, the epistle of James is not written by the Apostle James, but by James, the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, pastor of the church at Jerusalem. Uh, James, uh, James, the brother of John, was actually killed uh, and martyred in Acts chapter 12. We have the record of him uh, being martyred and uh, was the second recorded martyr, so far as I'm aware, uh, in the scriptures. Uh, another half-brother of Jesus wrote the last general epistle, Jude, and so their names are found in Mark chapter 6 and verse 3, Matthew 13, verse 55, list the, the siblings of the Lord Jesus, uh, and even his sister's names are mentioned. These would be half-brothers, half-sisters. They would be the product of Joseph and Mary, where Jesus is the product of the Holy Spirit and Mary. So uh, they have different fathers, but the same mother, which shoots the uh, Catholic teaching that Mary was a perpetual virgin. The Bible itself destroys that, uh, that myth uh, because she, her and Joseph had many others. In fact, the Bible says in John chapter 7 that Jesus' brothers did not believe on him until after the resurrection. John 7, 5 says, For neither did his brethren believe on him. Uh, but after he rose from the dead, at least two of his brethren that we know of, James and Jude, both came to know uh, their half-brother as their Lord and Savior as well and uh, would go on to be writers of Scripture. Of course, the general epistles include two letters by the apostle Peter. He wrote First and Second Peter. And then you have 1st and 2nd and 3rd John, those three letters written by John the Apostle. Uh, and uh, uh, he also wrote the Gospel of John and the book of Revelation uh, as well. So you have these writers, uh, that different writers that are writing. Uh, the distinction between the general epistles and the Pauline epistles is the Pauline epistles are, are pretty much all addressed to churches with the exception of Philemon. Um, and you could kind of count 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. We call those the pastoral epistles because they're written to pastors, but, uh, so they kind of have a local church mindset to them as well. But Philemon is written to a man. Hebrews is written to the Jewish people, a uh, little bit different flavor. But most of the Pauline epistles deal with church doctrine, church polity, uh, how, we, how we together as the body of Christ function, what our purpose is, how we should go about those things. The general epistles are not written to churches, but they're written to believers individually. And so they, I, I find them far more practical in their application. And often when people come to know Christ as their Savior uh, and they, say, they want to start reading the Bible, I always say, start in the Gospel of John, read the Gospel of John. It's the easiest of the four Gospels to read and understand. Once you've done that, go back, read Matthew, Mark, Luke. You'll get different, uh, different um, perspectives from the life of Christ. You have to put them all together, all four together, to get the full picture. But you get those four different perspectives because they have four different purposes to them. Uh, it, but then I usually say, and then go read the general epistles. Go, go to the book of James, start reading in James, go through Jude, because those are very practical, everyday, rubber-meets-the-road Christianity. Uh, and so as we go through this uh, series, 
we're going to find a lot more things that you individually can put into practice in your life versus when we go through a book like Romans or Ephesians, uh, we, there are things we can do individually, but there's also going to be a lot of things that he's speaking to the church corporate and we work together on and we have to do these things uh, as a church and, and so on. So, um, so there's a, a little bit of a distinction in, in these two um, sections of letters that we have uh, contained in the, in the New Testament. Um, James, as we mentioned, being the half-brother of the Lord, he's uh, the full brother of Jude, um, who wrote the book of Jude. James, uh, as we talked about, was not a believer uh, until after the resurrection, uh, and uh, I believe is, was the first pastor of the church at Jerusalem. Uh, by the time you read the book of Acts, and in Acts chapter 12, verse 17, there's indication uh, where... Um, where it said, take it, take it to the apostles and to James. And he's not talking about James, the, the brother, again, the brother of John the apostle. He, he was killed in Acts chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, but he's talking about James, the half-brother of Jesus. The apostles and James. James was distinct from the apostles because he wasn't an apostle, for one, and two, because he had pastoral leadership in the church. In Acts chapter 15, the controversy that is being dealt with, Peter stands up, and he gives a doctrinal position based on the scriptures, not all completely written yet, but Peter speaks through the Holy Spirit with the apostolic authority, the same authority of the word of God on the matter. So in essence, Peter was saying, this is, God's, this is the doctrinal position we are to take as a church. And then James stands up as the pastor of the church. He takes the doctrinal position he just heard from the apostle Peter, and he says, my decision or my sentence is... And as the pastor of the church, he makes a decision about what they are going to do as a church based on what the Scripture teaches and the Word of God says. And that's what pastoral leadership is. You look at what the Bible says, and then as the pastor, you say, this is what we're going to do. And they all gave their consent to it, but it really didn't matter whether they consented or not. He was taking the position based on the Word of God. So if they didn't consent, there was a problem with the congregation, not with the leadership. Uh, and that's, that's the way it's intended to work. So we see very often, even in, in the book of Galatians, chapter 2, uh, if you read through there, there's every indication that James uh, was the pastor and provided leadership uh, in the church at Jerusalem uh, through the time of the, the apostles. Uh, and what you see in the book of Acts, again, is a, a um, transition from apostolic authority and leadership to pastoral uh, leadership in the church, as the role of the apostles changed and really became just about writing the scripture and, and providing doctrinal clarity, uh, as more scripture was written, the apostles became less important. And when, when, the, when the apostle John died, he was the last apostle to die. When he died, apostolic authority ended, and now all of the authority was vested in the written word of God. Uh, and pastoral leadership just entails taking the written word of God and applying it in, in how the church is run, just doing it the way the instructions tell us to do it. Uh, and so it's a little bit about James. Um, we don't know much about him personally other than what I've uh, just shared with you, but uh, the book of James is believed to be, by a lot of people, probably the first of the New Testament epistles. It probably isn't the first book that's, that's written uh, for the New Testament, but it's probably one of the first letters to be written um, a lot of Paul's letters would come later uh, than this. Uh, in fact, all of Paul's letters would come later than this. And it's believed that Peter's letters and John's letters were probably later as well. <clears throat> so you have this, um, this probably being, they date it between 45 and 49 AD, uh, about 20 years after the crucifixion of Christ. Uh, if you're curious about these kind of things, the book of James is the 46th longest book in the Bible out of 66. It's only 20 books that are shorter, and it has five chapters, 108 verses, and 2,304 words. I did not count them. I merely took that off somebody else's, somebody else who has no life and counted them all, um, and I include that on. I had people at Fallsburg that wanted to know where each book ranked and all that, so I'd include them in these books. <clears throat> James quotes the Old Testament only four times, but he alludes to the Old Testament four, uh, 53 times. So in this very short book, you have a very heavy Old Testament foundation. 
being laid. He mentions five Old Testament characters, Abraham, Isaac, Rahab, Job, and Elijah. Uh, and uh, so, there, again, when people say, we don't need the Old Testament today, we don't, you know, we just need the New Testament. Good luck understanding what they're talking about uh, when you don't have the Old Testament, because the New Testament's built on the Old Testament, and anybody who had read the Bible more than five minutes should know that. Um, that's why I just, I just chuckle at people. I don't know how to help people that are that ignorant. Um, I don't know that there's enough wood to build the bridge from knowledge to their level of ignorance. Um, all I can do is say, why don't you keep reading the Bible and see if you don't run into some Old Testament quotations somewhere along the line or some things that you probably need to know from the Old Testament to be able to understand it. Um, so I just, I don't, I don't, I don't know how to help them. Um, but Martin Luther, the controversy around the book of James, there was controversy whether or not James should have remained in the canon of Scripture. Martin Luther once uh, referred to the book of James as an epistle of straw, um, and uh, <clears throat> that's because he mistakenly, as many did, mistakenly believed that James teaches a works-based salvation. James chapter 2, verse 24 uh, where James says, you see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Uh, and so there's a, a lack of biblical scholarship will lead you to the, uh, to the idea that James is talking about salvation coming from works, not by faith. It's not really what he's talking about. What he's talking about is, uh, as John Calvin commented on the issue, he said, faith alone saves, but the faith that saves is not alone. It has works attached to it. So, you know, faith, a living faith and a lively faith always produces works, and saving faith can be seen in the works that stem from that saving faith. And if you have no works that stem from that saving faith, what James is saying is you don't have saving faith. And so it's a very clear distinction. Works don't save you, but works do evidence that you're saved. It is an evidence when, you're, when those works flow from the faith you put in Jesus Christ, that's an evidence that you're saved. And if you claim to be saved and there's none of those works that flow, you better check yourself before you get to judgment day because you may not be going where you think you're going. Uh, you may, may want to pack some cool clothing on your trip. Um, but James has written to early Jewish believers that were scattered both by Roman persecution and and Jewish persecution, but they were also suffering and being scattered, being driven out uh, by the famine that was there. There were Gentile believers that were living in, um, living in Israel uh, that were believers and part of the church, um, and uh, they, they were people that, like you see on the day of Pentecost, there were 16 different language groups present at the temple on the day of Pentecost, and so there was preaching to them, and people got saved from 16 different language groups on that day. Uh, and so you had people that would come, and they would, they would get saved. They would hear the gospel in Jerusalem or in one of the churches around Israel, uh, and many times they would stay to be part of that church rather than go back. Uh, they were also being scattered because, again, you have Jewish persecution, you have Roman persecution, and you have, have a famine, a, a dearth that's going on that is making life miserable. So the persecution really in the middle of the first century is very, um, very Jewish, and, and then it picks up with Roman persecution more. And then as you get a little bit past the middle of the uh, first century, uh, there is a famine, a drought, a prolonged drought that strikes. And of course, in those societies, their entire society was agrarian-based. It was agriculture-based. So if you have a famine, you have a drought, and you can't grow crops, you can't feed your cattle, your economy collapses and people go looking for food. Uh, the government didn't show up with bucket loads of food and EBT cards, and they didn't go to the grocery store to get all their stuff. Uh, they, they really relied on uh, growing a lot of their own food, even in the cities and markets. Um, they, you know, if the food wasn't there, well, you can't eat air, so uh, they would have to go look for food. And so this is the, this is the backdrop for which the book of James starts. And it's helpful to know that that is the backdrop because of how the book of James starts. Uh, and it starts with a simple 
admonition. And as he says in verse 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, his, his credentials that he gives is not, I'm the half-brother of Jesus and pastor of the church at Jerusalem. He says, I'm just a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the highest honor in, in the early church, the highest honor in the mindset was, because it was what Christ taught them, was that being a servant was, was the highest position in the kingdom of God. Um, the highest position in the kingdom of God was not the person who had the most money or the most authority or the most power. The highest position in the kingdom of God was always the servant. And so James doesn't pull rank based on his family connections. He doesn't pull rank based on his position as, as pastor of the leading church in Christianity, the first church in Christianity, probably the first pastor in Christianity, if you think about it. He doesn't pull any of that rank. He just simply introduces himself as a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't say, my brother, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. Again, he's writing to these Jewish believers that are being scattered. There were Jewish non-believers being scattered too, but he's not, he's not writing to non-believers so much as he's writing to believers. Uh, verse 2, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. So if you know the background, if you know what James is, who James is writing to and why these 12 tribes are scattered abroad, Right out of the gate, he goes to the heart of the issue. My, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Count it joy when you're suffering and you're in, in times of trial. The word temptation, we generally associate with the temptation to do wrong, but the word temptation can also just mean trials. Uh, and they were certainly going through, uh, through trials. And in verse 3, he says, knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience. So we know we're not talking about temptations, different temptations to do evil. He's talking about different temptations, the, the different trials that people were going through. Uh, people had left Israel, Jewish believers had left Israel, maybe because they were persecuted by people like Saul of Tarsus uh, in the Pharisees. Some may have left because they were persecuted by Rome, who was trying to put this new cult out of business early on, or they may have left because they were losing economic opportunities because of their faith in Christ. There was just, uh, you know, you could lose your job, you could lose your home, you could lose your livelihood. People wouldn't buy from you. If you were a craftsman, they wouldn't hire you to build things. Uh, and so they had to leave and go other places simply because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And what does James start out by telling them right out of the gate? Hi, I'm James. I'm writing to you that have been scattered. And the first thing he says is you should, you should count it as joyful when you, get, you go through these things that you're going through. You should count it all joy. Now, that's contrary to human logic and human reasoning. And he doesn't say, he doesn't, he doesn't pacify their feelings by saying, you know, what you're going through is not fair, and you, you, know, you shouldn't have to deal with these trials, and they're there, and any of that stuff. He, he bypasses all of that psychological mumbo-jumbo, and he goes right to the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is, look, we all go through trials. There are different types of trials that we all go through. And no matter what type of trial it is, you should, you should give thanks for it. You should count it a joy to be tried. Well, that, why, why would that be the case, James? That would be the logical question when you, I mean, if you were reading this letter, if somebody was reading this letter in your church and you had fled your homeland to get away from all of the trials that you had, you were finding difficulty settling into a new pagan city, trying to find other believers to be encouraged by, you don't have a Bible to take with you you're now separated from the apostles and their leadership and their explanation of the truth of Scripture, and you're trying to figure out how to please the Lord Jesus Christ with your life, not having the full Scriptures to do it by, and being really chased out of your homeland, being chased out of your culture, being chased out of your job, and here you are in a foreign place, and James says, hey, uh, what are you sad about? You should count it all joy. Well, why, James? Why, why is that the case? 
And in verse 3 is the answer, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And it's important to note that James in verse 2 does not say, if you fall into diverse temptations. He says, when you fall into diverse temptations. It's difficult to know without being a little bit harsh, but I, I always have the tendency to go the harsh route first, and I really have to temper that because that's not always the route you should go. But when people feel sorry for themselves, I generally go straight to the harsh route because why are you feeling sorry for yourself? There's no excuse in Scripture for feeling sorry for yourself. There's no permission granted anywhere in Scripture to feel sorry for yourself. In fact, when you are going through a hard time, when it's unfair, when the boss is a jerk, when people are on you because of your faith in Christ, when, uh, when the bills are piling up, when, when you got bypassed for the promotion, when uh, you know, you've got doctor's visits and things like that, some of those things everybody goes through, and some are unique to believers because of our stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. When we go through those, instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, we're supposed to be happy about it because that, that trying of our faith brings about patience. It, it produces patience in our life. And patience is merely endurance or perseverance. You don't get stronger by sitting on a comfy couch. You get stronger by going to work. And trials are a way for God to put your faith to work. Because in the times of trials is when you have to actually exercise faith. When everything's going good, you can just sit back and say, everything's going good. I don't, have to, I don't have to worry about anything. But when things aren't going good, you have to remind yourself and deliberately choose to live by faith and trust God and claim His promises. It draws you usually closer to the Lord if you will let it. If you will let the trials do their job, you can count it all joy because at the end of this trial, I should have a better relationship with the Lord. I should see him work in my life and keep his promises. And I should have more faith in him, a stronger faith in him when I come out on the other side. That's why we count it joy. That's why we say, all right, here's a trial. This is an opportunity for my relationship with Christ to really grow. But that's never how we look at those. The trials come, we want to say, well, this isn't fair. Why is this happening to me? I do the same thing. I know, I know what you all do, because I do the same thing. I'm a human being like you. And, well, that's not fair. How come this doesn't happen to me? How come this is happening? How come this? How come, why is this? It's not fair. Look, you know, what have I done to deserve this? Look, we go through those times, but we need to train ourselves to realize that we should be thankful because we have the opportunity, if we allow it to, we have the opportunity for our faith in the Lord to, to grow, our relationship with the Lord to be closer, and to see God potentially do something miraculous in order to keep his promises. Because he will never fail to keep his promises. So the more unlikely it looks that God is going to be able to keep his promise, the more miraculous his keeping of the promise will appear. And so sometimes the trial has to be really dark for you to get some strength from it. And you're like, I don't see how God can do what he said he was going to do in this trial. And then out of nowhere, like parting the Red Sea, the answer comes. God gives the answer because he never, ever fails. And so when we come out the other side and we are stronger in our walk with the Lord and we've seen him do the next to miraculous, if not the miraculous in our life, then there's joy in that. But we can joy when we fall into the trial because God will not fail if we trust in him. So we might as well have the joy at the beginning of the trial because if we do what we're supposed to do, we'll have joy at the end of the trial. So you might as well just enjoy the journey because you're going through the trial whether you like it or not. And the choice of whether it turns out good for you or not is really yours. God's already determined he wants to work it together for your good. If you'll let him and get out of his way. And so being feeling sorry for yourself, getting depressed, getting anxious, full of care, full of woe, those are not how we're supposed to respond to this. Now, this is good stuff, and we're only in verse 3. 
The general epistles is full of this. Can you imagine getting this letter from James? James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he pens the autographs, the autograph of the, the letter, and then they begin to hand copy the manuscripts, and they send the manuscripts in every direction to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. And can you imagine having lost and left behind everything, many of them lost their families because they have accepted Christ as their Savior, and their family rejects them because of it. It's that way in Judaism today. Jewish, Jewish Orthodox people who trust Christ as their Savior are often cut out of their families. To be saved means to give up your family. Same thing's true in Islam. Same thing's true in Buddhism and Hinduism. It means giving up your family. It means not being able to go back to your homeland. Well, that's not fair. Especially we as Americans, we say, well, that's not fair. That's not the way it should be because we have religious freedom here. You have the freedom to believe whatever you want, no matter how stupid it is. In fact, you have the freedom to say whatever you want, no matter how stupid it is. And Facebook gives everybody, and X gives everybody the opportunity to make a fool of themselves. It's not that way in other countries. Kamala and Casey, who are here this morning, Kamala comes from Nepal. She's watched Christians be burned to death. It was illegal for her to get baptized. She got baptized here. She couldn't get baptized in Nepal. It was illegal. We had to mute the audio because her family could face repercussions back in her home country if she got baptized. We don't understand that. When she married Casey, her family held a funeral for her. Now, they've reconciled since to some degree, and there's hope that her father one day will trust Christ as his Savior. And if, if father trusts Christ as their Savior, there's a good chance the rest of the family will trust Christ as their Savior because in their culture, the father's the head of the clan, and whatever he says is law. So pray for her dad. If he gets saved, there will be a lot of other people in the family that will probably get saved. That he's the key to winning that family to Christ. Nobody's getting saved until dad says it's okay. So understand that it's not that way everywhere. It's, in fact, this way in very few places we have the kind of opportunity we have. So we don't even understand the kind of trials that James is talking about. Because the trials James is talking about are the trying of their faith more than just the trying of their patience. Like we would say, you know, traffic is backed up and we think we're, we're being persecuted for the faith. You know, Lord, I'm enduring this great trial of affliction. Um, and, uh, you know, every, every martyr is, that's up in heaven is just laughing at us going, you have no idea what a trial actually is, son. But, but knowing this, the trying of your faith worketh patience, it creates endurance, it creates perseverance, it makes you stronger, and as Pastor Chapel likes to say, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. If you haven't had your faith tested, then why would you count on it or rely on it? God is from time to time going to test your faith to see what it is made of, and you will find out real quick in a trial what your faith is made of. There's a lot of believers who don't make it very far after they get saved. They go through the simplest of trials and they bail and run. They never understand what it truly means to be a Christian. If you watch TV commercials, which most of us try to avoid at all costs, maybe you're up at 3 o'clock in the morning, you can't sleep, you turn on something and there's an infomercial on there, and they've got this home gym system and they got this, you know, they got a man and a woman, and they both, you know, they're toned, they're fit, they look healthy. And the, the whole point of the commercial is if you buy our thing and for just 30 minutes a day use our thing, you will look like that. And the reality is none of those models look like that because they use that thing for 30 minutes a day. They look like that because they spend hours in the gym every week. And they eat things that I don't want to eat. 
they don't eat Big Macs and they don't have hot fudge sundaes and look like that. I don't want to look like that bad enough to give up hot fudge sundaes. It's not worth it to me. I'd rather die young with a hot fudge sundae in my hand, live to be 100, eating celery and carrots all day. Now, I like celery and carrots, but I have my limit to them. And then it's time for the chocolate course. There's got the bread course, the salad course, the soup course, the main course, the dessert course, and the chocolate course. Every meal's got to have the chocolate course. Even my breakfast sometimes, I sneak some chocolate in there. But you know what? You, the same thing is true spiritually. Christians want to come to church and sit in the, in the pew for half an hour a week, and they, they think that they're going to be buff and tone and ready to run the Christian race. Well, that's not how that thing works. You're going to have to do some work, and God will put you through trials, and you're going to have to work at believing and trusting and it's not going to be easy, but God never fails. So know that you're on the winning team and that you will eventually come through that trial and you will eventually be, be, be victorious. And in the cases, and, and Brother Ed was just telling me today, um, Ruth went to the ER again, they did some CAT scans and they found the cancer is spreading and she's going to be entering into hospice care. And we love her to death but she's going to be healed of her cancer soon. God could heal her with a miracle and just go, no more cancer. He could do that. I don't think he's going to do that, though. But he can also say, come on home, and she'll be healed. She'll never have cancer again. You see, you can't defeat a child of God who knows his position in Christ. You can't defeat us. Paul said, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Okay, Rome, you want to kill me? That's fine. I'm ready to go to heaven. I find that as a pleasurable experience, going to heaven. I want to go to heaven, and if you want to send me there sooner rather than later, I'm not going to fight you on it. But if I'm still breathing, then I'm still going to be writing scripture and I'm still going to be preaching the gospel and I'm still going to be doing everything I can to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, whether I'm in chains in a jail cell or whether I'm out on the street corner or I'm out in the temple or wherever I am, I'm going to keep serving Christ. As long as I'm breathing, I'm serving Christ. When I stop breathing, I'm going to be in heaven. I find that a far better appealing thing than continuing to serve Christ, in fact. So if those are the only two alternatives that you're faced with if you're Rome or you're the Pharisees and you're trying to get rid of Paul and the only two options are leave him alone and he keeps preaching the gospel or kill him and he goes to heaven and he seems really happy about that, how do we beat a guy like that? Because if we kill him and make a martyr out of him, we seal in his own blood the message that he preached with his mouth. He was willing to die for this. It, there'll be people who will say, he was willing to go through what for that? You, you mean while they were throwing stones at him, he didn't curse him, he didn't, didn't change his mind, he didn't say, I'm sorry, he didn't promise never to do it again. Instead, he, he said something along the lines of, hey, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. I'm ready to go home. Keep on throwing them stones. Maybe there's something to that. Man's willing to die for it. He must really believe it. Maybe I ought to listen to that. So if you're the Pharisees, if you're Rome, how do you get rid of a guy like that? How do you defeat him? You can't. The answer is you can't. You kill him, he wins, because he gets to go to heaven. You don't kill him, he wins, because he's going to keep serving the Lord Jesus Christ and racking up rewards for when he does eventually get there. You can't beat Paul. And you can't beat a believer who has that attitude. I'm not quitting. I'm not quitting. Life's going to be unfair. Life's going to be hard. Life's going to be tough. I'm going to get diseases. I'm going, I might have cancer. I might be in an accident. I might get paralyzed. I might do whatever. But that's not going to stop me from serving the Lord Jesus Christ. If I'm breathing, I'm serving Christ. And if I'm dead, I'm far better off. Now, Satan, what are you going to do about it? The answer is there's nothing he can do about it. 
He can only do to me what my Father lets him do. He can only bring the, bring the trials and tribulations to me that the Father lets him to. And, God, and the Father only lets him to because God's got a plan to glorify Christ in my body, whether it be by life or by death, to magnify Christ in my body and to work it all together for good for me. If, if God didn't see a way to magnify Christ and work it to my good, he just simply says, no, you can't do that, devil. Know that every trial that ever comes into the life of a believer was submitted to the desk of the Almighty, and he signed off on it and said, yes, I'm going to allow that to come into their life so that Christ may be magnified and I can work it together for their good. And then he says to us, you should be happy about that. I'm working out a plan from the throne of the universe. I'm working out a plan in your life. I didn't lose concentration when that car T-boned you. I didn't fall asleep when cancer formed in your body. I allowed that to happen because I have a special plan. I'm going to do through you something I could not do otherwise without this trial. And James says, don't feel sorry for yourself. Be happy about it. And then what does he say in verse 4? But let patience have her perfect work. The word perfect there means mature. Let patience have her perfect work. That ye may be perfect, mature, and entire, meaning complete, wanting nothing. See, God wants to finish the work that he started in you when he saved you. He, the salvation is the start of a process that is completed really at the rapture in which we are given our glorified bodies. We are immor our, Im our mortality puts on immortality and our corruptible puts on incorruption. And death is defeated in our, in our bodies. And along this process, he doesn't want us to just get saved and keep floundering in the old life that we had. He, as we get saved, he wants to teach us the things of heaven. You are learning by being a Christian and following the word of God. You are learning how to live in heaven. You are learning the, the keys to the kingdom of God. What, what is it going to be like in heaven? How, how are we going to act in heaven? What are, what are the expectations on us in heaven? Well, we're going to be joyful in heaven, so why don't you rejoice now forevermore? Start rejoicing now because you're going to be rejoicing for eternity. So start now. Learn how to do that now, even in trials and tribulations. So when you get to heaven, that rejoicing is so much sweeter. It, the rejoicing won't be simply because life is so good in heaven. The rejoicing will be because no matter whether we're abound or whether we're abased, whether things are good or whether things are bad, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ there. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us here. We can have joy here. We're going to have joy there. All we're doing is learning how to, how to bring heaven down to us to some degree. The joy that we will have in heaven is available. The same level of joy available in heaven is available right now. The same level of peace available in heaven is available now because heaven isn't what produces peace and joy. The Holy Spirit of God is what produces peace and joy. And we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us. And if we let him produce the fruit that he wants to produce, we have love and we have joy and we have peace and we have patience and all the other fruit of the Spirit. We have all those things. We're going to have those things perfectly in abundance in heaven. We won't have any, any reason not to have all those things there. But what God is trying to teach us in the New Testament and, and explaining how the Christian life is supposed to work is you don't have to wait to heaven to be happy. You don't have to wait to heaven to be at peace. You don't have to wait to heaven to enjoy the blessings of salvation. You can have that here. And even in trial and tribulation, you can have joy, and you can have peace, and you can have love, and you can have gentleness, and you can have goodness, and you can have faith, and you can have meekness, you can have temperance, you can have all of those things that will be easy to have in heaven because there's no sin there and will be perfect and complete. But James says God is in working that process out now, and the sooner you get going on that process, the more of heaven you will enjoy right here, right now. 
Isn't that wild? We think we're all waiting to heaven to enjoy the ride. And believe me, I'm looking forward to going to heaven. The rapture happens this evening. You're not going to have me going, oh, shucks. I'm going to be like, where, where were you yesterday, Lord? I was ready to go yesterday. My clock, you're late. I was ready to go 10 years ago. Let the Antichrist have the world. Not much here I'm interested in anymore. My interests lie more and more on the other side. I mean, I have a stake in the election. I know who I'm voting for. I know who I'm not voting for. I know who no Christian has any business voting for. I'm not saying you have to vote for the other candidate. I'm just saying I don't understand how any Christian could justify voting for one of them. And if you don't know which one it is, come see me later, I'll tell you. Let me tell you, I'm, I'm not all that hot and bothered about the election. The election's going to go, and America's going to get the president we deserve. And let me tell you, either one of them we deserve. But you know what? My citizenship really isn't here. It's there. There are no elections in heaven because we have a prince of peace who rules heaven and it's perfect. Don't need no stinking elections up there. You know, there are no laws up there because there's no sin. There's no crime. There's no police. There's no jails. You know, there's no doctors. There are no undertakers. There are no cemeteries. There are no armies. No soldiers, no sailors, no Marines, because there's no war, there's no fighting. It's perfect. That's where my citizenship lies. And when I see our world falling apart, I look at Scripture and I say, we're right on schedule. This is exactly the way the Bible says it's supposed to go right at the end. So you know what I keep doing? I keep peeking over at the eastern sky every morning. Think about going out into the front yard and doing some rapture practice. Because it ain't going to be long. I don't know how long it'll be. Paul thought it was going to be in his day, but you know Paul was wrong. I think it's going to be in my day. I think I'm right. I think it's going to be soon. I think I'm right. And if we have a great revival that sweeps America, I will say, the Lord's coming back soon. This has got to be the last call. God gave us one more chance. And if there's not a revival that sweeps America, I'll say it's got to be close because it just keeps getting worse and worse. Either way, I think it's close. So I don't get so hot and bothered and worried. I don't hang on to every move of the stock market or what the bond yield is or what the price of gold is. By the way, you can have all the gold you want, but you can't eat gold. And the tribulation food will be so expensive, gold will be useless. If you've got food, you're not giving it away at any price because you need it to survive. So those who are stockpiling gold and are going through the tribulation, good luck. We can't eat it. You'd be better off planting a garden than uh, stockpiling gold. Canning, better idea than stockpiling gold. Let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire. You may be mature and complete. And how does that verse end? Wanting nothing or lacking nothing. Now, we're not talking about the physical here. Kenneth Copeland and Creflo Dollar knows that they'll be on TV saying, see, God wants you to be rich, and he wants you to have everything, and he wants you to get the money, and he wants you to get ahead, and, you know, if you don't have six planes like I do, then, you know, then you're not living right, and God's not blessing you, and all that kind of stuff. It's baloney. 
God is less interested in your, your financial well-being than he is your spiritual well-being. Like the Bible isn't written so you get rich in this world. It's written so you could get rich in the next. And those liars and deceivers, when they get to the next world, <laughs> Lord help them. I can hear it just now, the Kenneth Copelands and the Joel Osteens. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name done many wonderful works? Depart from me. I never knew you, workers of iniquity. What? Yeah, I guess being rich wasn't the key to getting to heaven, Joel. Ken? Creflo? Who names their kid Creflo? I don't understand that. Call him Kevin, not Creflo. Dollar's a good last name for his ministry, but never trust a preacher whose name ends in dollar. I won't. John would have appreciated the joke that just ran through my mind, but he would have been the only one. I'm saying a guy named Dollar has no sense. Anyway, um, pretty good, John. See, he's smiling. You know what God wants to do? He wants to give you all of the spiritual blessings. He wants you, let me rephrase that. That was incorrect biblical phrasing. He wants you to enjoy all of the spiritual blessings he gives to every believer here now. In fact, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, you can, you can look at Ephesians chapter 1, it's okay. I don't think I'm coming back to James. Look at verse 3, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with, what's the next word? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The difference between here and heaven is we will have the material, the external blessings of being in a perfect environment when we're in heaven. But you will not get one more spiritual blessing than you already have now if you're a believer. You already have them all. The problem is we don't know what we have and we don't know how to use them. And what James is trying to tell us is the trials force us to unpack the blessings and go to the resources we have. Now, we can run from God and we can take matters in our own hands and we're going to make a royal mess of things and then we're going to be in deep trouble. Or we can go to God and figure out how to get through this time of trial and in that time of trial, we're going to find out some of the blessings. God's going to open up that box that has been sitting in the corner that we didn't know what that box was and what it was for. And he's going to open that box up and he's going to say, now here's, here's, this, here's some joy, here's some peace. You're going to say, I didn't know I had that. You know? In fact, you'll come to my office and say, God gave me such peace. Well, he didn't give you any more peace than you already had. You had it. You just finally unpacked it. You started using the peace that he already gave you is the correct way to understand that. God gave me such joy. No, no. He gave you the joy before. You just unpacked it. Now you're using it for the first time. But it took the trial for you to go and unopen the box and see what you had available to you. You were in a tough spot, and you became a spiritual MacGyver. What do I got? I got bubble gum, duct tape, and a straw. I'm going to make a nuclear bomb out of this. You go, God, I don't have anything. I don't know what to do. And he doesn't say, you're right, you have nothing. He says, no, wait a minute. I've given you my Holy Spirit. I've given you my word. Get in the word. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Trust me. We're going to get through this. And along the way, you're going to find that you have some things you didn't know you had before. You ever break down on the side of the road and you start digging through your glove box and you come across a book written by the same people who designed your car, and you say, oh, I didn't know this was in here.
Or what's this extra tire that I just found underneath the carpeting in my trunk? I don't, didn't know where that came. You always had it. You just didn't know about it until you had to look for it. That's why trials come. So you should be happy when trials come because you, if you follow God, you are going to unpack some things you didn't even know you had, but you already had them. God's not giving you more. You're just using what he's already gave you more. That's the difference. So be happy because you're about to discover some really cool tools that you had in the basement that you never knew was even there. Count it all joy. When the trial's over, you'll be more mature in your walk with Christ. You'll be more complete than you were before. And that means you're going to enjoy more of the spiritual blessings than you ever had before. Now, that's only the first, what, four verses, five verses? This is a fun series. I love it. You're going to get your hair preached off. Some of you beat me to the punch. Um, but we're going to... We're going to enjoy this series. Let's stand together for closing prayer.